Amazing. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Beck Rumble. I'm uh, the CEO of the Rust Foundation. And I'm Gracie Gregory, Director of Communications and Marketing at the Rust Foundation. We are very excited to be presenting this talk today. I have been spending weeks convincing my friends and family not in the industry that this is a very juicy topic. So. <laughs> Normal people have no idea. <laughs> So, um, just in case none of you are aware, Rust Foundation, we're, you know, we're one of the smaller foundations. We're not like big like Linux, but um, yeah, we're a 501c6, we're independent, um, and you know, we exist to support and steward the, the Rust programming language. This does require direct collaboration and consultation with the Rust project maintainers and the wider community. So, um, you know, I, you're, you're at a trademark talk, so we're not going to teach you how to suck eggs here. Um, you know, trademarks are names and designs that tell the world um, the source of a particular good or service. So in our case, um, these marks include the R gear logo, and they also include the cargo logo, which no one wants to use because it's a bit crap, um, but it doesn't include Ferris, our lovely crab. Um, these also include the words for us in cargo and crates. Um, so, you know, we, we do have two very, you know, properly trademarked things, but we also have the Ferris, which I think actually is one of the most recognizable um, kind of mascots and images associated with Rust. So. On to the meat of our of our subject matter today, the intersection of trademarks and open source. Um, at the risk of boiling it down a little bit too far, there are many passionate opinions in open source and in general, actually, about about trademarks and that concept in general. Um, for those of you who are here today, sort of wondering how trademarks fit into this open source landscape. Um, repeating probably what we all already know and probably all, everyone here at Open Source Summit agrees upon, which is that code is meant to be shared and modified. Um, the Rust Foundation definitely agrees with that. <laughs> um, in the case of software, trademarks really enable end users to identify a particular version of software, to know who's behind it, where it came from. And without trademarks, things can sometimes get chaotic and occasionally risky quickly. So there is real value behind trademarks in this ecosystem. So now we're gonna dive in and talk about exactly where trademarks do provide value. So QA, basically when anyone can change source code and produce something new from it, it's very important that the original artifact or approved versions are what can use the marks. An extension of this, trust, consumer and community trust. So the Rust trademarks in particular are meant to provide assurance to end users that a product or service they're using with Rust in the name is safe and is reliable. Going into that is clarity. So having a trademark policy really allows us to ensure that the word Rust can't be used to trick people, very important, into using something that would compromise safety and security. So if malicious actors can misrepresent their code as coming from the Rust project or from the Rust Foundation, people will believe it to be safe. Very basic things that we all here are probably familiar with. This is something of an extreme example, I suppose, but what's actually interesting to me is where there is unintentional confusion of people using the marks uh, in a way that isn't approved. Very often, people will use it in a way that, that they don't mean to be malicious. Um, so either way, there can be confusion in this area, and big problems can really result if people aren't clear on what is and is not officially affiliated with Rust and what isn't, or another open source programming project. Going off of this security, um, so trademark and copyright protection is the main tool used to combat phishing attacks, malicious squatting of like name resources. An example of this is someone sending an email phishing campaign from the official Rust project website or from crates.io. And to continue with the phishing attack example, the more explicit the names are in a trademark policy, the easier that process is on our end and less costly it is to involve legal counsel. And where this becomes really important for the Rust Foundation and for the Rust ecosystem is that we're able to conserve more of, a, of our financial resources and put that 
funding back into the project if we aren't spending our budget dealing with these sorts of things. <laughs> On lawyers. Yes, expensive, <laughs> as it turns out. So that hopefully makes sense. Um, you know, and Rust already had a trademark policy. So why, why rock the boat? Why update it? Um, so, you know, we had a Rust trademark policy long before the foundation was actually created um, in the days when it was being uh, incubated uh, under Mozilla. Um, this was migrated when we were spun out into an independent foundation. Um, so the, you know, the case study we're like looking at is looking at that policy and how, how we are still going about updating it. Um, so in terms of the reasons that, that we wanted to update it, not just because, you know, we had nothing better to do, um, when the foundation was created, the, the corporate governance identified the policy as not fit for purpose. It would need, you know, legal counsel, it would need polishing, it would need further consulting, cons consultation with the community. Um, there was kind of consensus amongst the people that helped put the foundation together into existence that this needed work. Um, in terms of like fair use, there were some serious gray areas. Um, in terms of US copyright law, fair use kind of indicates the usage of trademark material in a way that is permitted and in accordance with a trademark policy. So you need a really robust policy in able to be able to define fair use. Um, the initial policy it had language that didn't really, for instance, differentiate between commercial and non-commercial use of the rust marks. Um, there was some ambiguity about what could and couldn't be called rust or where rust could be used in a naming convention. Um, and you know, with crates um, and other packages, there was there was some use here and you know, no use there, and lots of people kind of having a discussion or an argument, but no one really being able to say, no, this is the definitive, uh, this is the definitive thing. So there was there was a definite need um, for for this to be overhauled, and that was kind of our starting point. Um, we also, as a foundation, because of the way the, the policy is phrased, we receive a ton of queries um, about what is permitted or can I do this, um, most of which could probably just, you know, be dealt with under a more clear trademark policy on the website. You know, we wouldn't need to answer every single email. We can just kind of direct people, hopefully, to something that has clarity and they can know for sure I'm up. I'm fine to do this, you know, I, I'm not at risk if I, if I do this. And, you know, obviously, because we're talking about trademarks and law, we obviously had to talk to lawyers um, who, again, obviously didn't look at it and say, no, 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 that's tip top, <laughs> I'm done here. Um, they obviously identified a couple of key areas where, you know, potentially if we did want to enforce in the future, we would find it very difficult to do so because of the, well, the, the way the language was. So assuming you're all with us so far, we're going to move on to some steps that we followed to begin updating the, at the time, existing Rust language trademark policy. So first step, very important, um, we consulted members of the Rust project. So for a bit of context, the Rust Foundation's governance model includes what we call project directors. So these are elected representatives of the Rust project who serve on our board and who have equal voting power to our corporate member directors. So their input matters tremendously. That's why that role is baked into our bylaws. Um, so one of our first steps when it became clear that this was a priority to update the policy was to lean on our project directors to decide how to best proceed. And in doing that, they recommended that we basically spearhead the creation of a task group with wider participation from other leaders, other people within the Rust project. And we did this by inviting the Rust project to volunteer using a communication platform called Zulip. So once we had that task group put together, um, we jointly decided that the first priority was to in was to issue an initial survey via Google Forms. Looking back, I don't know that they necessarily would have advocated for a form. That's never something that 
with the Rust project, I would guess, you know, surveys, Google Forms, yes. Um, but when you need to gather feedback from a large group of people, Google Forms surveys uh, really do help. So that's the tool that we used. So basically in that survey, what we did was just ask the Rust community if they had opinions on where we should start with all of this. And after we shared those results and summaries from that first survey, we got to work with legal counsel, creating a first draft of a new trademark policy. And we leaned on legal counsel that has a lot of experience uh, in open source, in trademark, copyright, and also marketing law, as it turns out in my research. Um, so the task group reviewed this draft and provided some initial input to us. And this group was in favor of more feedback from the wider community, so they urged us to, to have a second round of feedback and input. So what we did is we opted to attach our draft of the new policy to a Google form and share it publicly to collect more comments. So if you thought that this was an instructive talk where we say follow our lead and do every single thing we're talking about here, this is where there's a bit of a record scratch and where things get interesting. Yeah, you're in the wrong talk. <laughs> So it's time to remind you of the subheading of our talk, which is the highs and lows of this process and where things went a bit haywire. So we asked for feedback, ask and you shall receive. Um, we solicited input on the first draft and I really wanna stress that we said, this is a draft. We just like your feedback so we can iterate. Um, and we got a lot of feedback. We got so much feedback. <laughs> um, we had over 3,200 <laughs> responses. This is um, what we in marketing call great engagement. This, <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a great spin on that. Um, yeah, ask and you shall receive. Um, be careful what you wish for. Um, you know, when it comes to Google Forms sent out to an unknown number of people, you know, anyone could comment because we didn't want to make it, you know, we put, put parameters on it. Um, you know, response figures like this. Um, this means you have a very passionate community um, and that we've probably struck a nerve um, or we've, you know, tapped into some sort of real, you know, unknown passion for, for trademark law in the community. Um, so, you know, we, we knew, okay, <laughs> this, is, this is a thing. Um, we got, to be fair, we absolutely got scores of helpful, apt, incisive, fantastic suggestions and comments. We got a, a lot of really good actionable feedback in that 3,200 or just over. Um, so we, you know, I'm stressing that now so that that doesn't get lost in this because unfortunately when you do have that many responses, some shit gets lost. <laughs> <laughs> so that said, um, you know, we, we got some other stuff too. <laughs> So yes, uh, unfortunately not all Sunshine Roses, high survey engagement. We also got scores of comments that were not only extremely negative, um, which is pr to be expected when you're asking for feedback on something like this, but also a lot of comments that were without any kind of instruction attached to them, sometimes with harassing language. So here's just a little lovely word cloud to give you a <laughs> sense of some of the words that we saw in those 3,200 plus responses. Um, and what we're not going to do in this presentation is share screenshots. That would probably be the most juicy approach we could follow, but we didn't ask for permission for that. And a lot of that language, as you can probably tell, uh, is not fit for a stage here at Open Source Summit. So if you're attending this talk, you might be familiar with the fact that this really became a hydra of a situation and blew up in certain circles online. Understandably, like we said, a lot of passionate opinions, so people naturally, very likely, shared with their network. Other people participated, but then it sort of started to collect input from people who were basically there to spread possibly some paranoia, um, some hate mongering, and, you know, share the link to the survey widely. And there were a lot of suspicions in those comments of a power grab situation from the Rust Foundation. And again, that's not to say that some people didn't actually have concerns about that. And we want to know if the community has concerns about that. But a lot of the public comments that we got uh, in some of these clips 
weren't necessarily the most productive. So again, as Beck said, not all the feedback we received was negative or not actionable, but yes, the categorization of these clips is accurate. <laughs> and I think it's, it's fair to say that we did suffer some reputational damage with certain segments of the REST community, which is very important to us that that does not happen. And yes, it felt very much that everyone was very angry with us and very quickly it became very hard to maintain any kind of perspective on how large this was because it's our world, our universe. This situation mattered a great deal to us. And I should say, we were of course aware of the risk of opening an open feedback form on the internet. But when this <laughs> happens and you get this kind of response, it can be really hard to manage emotions on a team individually. It was very challenging, to say the least. I mean, so what went wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Why did it all start to fall apart? Um, you know, slowly at first and then all at once. Um, it felt like there was, there was definitely logic. There was definitely logic underneath some of the, the unhappiness. We'd gotten caught in a bit of a, oh, this will make for great clickbait situation, um, which had kind of exacerbated and amplified um, a lot of the response. But, you know, there, there, were, there were real emotions and there were very valid um, emotions and, and opinions underneath all of this. So as, as difficult as it was to stop doom scrolling through the really hateful comments, because it was, it was awful and good fun in equal measure at times. Um, yeah, we kind of, we had to, we had to try really hard with so many responses. And those were just, you know, those were just the responses to the survey. That was nothing, you know, compared to the Reddit threads, the Twitter or X threads, the threads in platforms that I'm not even cool enough to be on. You know, there, there was just this entire kind of reaction across so many multiple different platforms and, you know, journalists and journalists and journalists. Um, calling us up and asking for, for comments and stuff. Um, and even though we were kind of surprised by it, we shouldn't have been surprised. You know, a lo logical Beck was thinking, but this is just a draft. We've just asked you for comments. We're not saying we're going to impose this. Um, but yeah, that's really not how it came across. And the language was so scary that, you know, we, we can, with a bit of perspective now, really understand that we we did wrong here. We we were not doing this in a way we should have done it. Um, I mean, we're still a really young organization. You know, the Rust Foundation was constituted in like 2021. It's 2024 now. This was last year. Um, so we were, you know, we were pretty young still. We're still growing as a you know staff team, really small. Um, and I think because we were young, and because you know, those of us, some of us in the foundation are not directly from the community. We've come in from outside. Um, I think there was a real uh, fear, as Gracie said earlier, that we were doing this as a kind of power grab, that, you know, we were trying to use this to assert our dominion um, over the project and, and the community. Um, and, you know, because, you know, this is open source, there had been dramas in the past. Um, I think this kind of sort of all fed into into that kind of lack of lack of trust and um, you know a, a kind of an immediate assumption of bad faith. Um, there was also like a lack of clarity, I think, on who had been involved in putting this draft together um, that that had suddenly like gone public. You know, people inside the project, the people that that we kind of talked to, who were leaders in the project, they were aware that this was going on. But there wasn't necessarily a cascade of information kind of going directly out into the community. So if you are one or two or three steps removed from the leaders in the Rust project, then you probably didn't see anything between us putting a survey out in September, I think it was 2022, um, to us putting this enormous draft out um, in the next April. Um, so yeah. A, a lack of clarity, a lack of like information. Um, no, keep it um, the other thing that was really difficult was even, you know, we're young as a foundation. The Rust project is young as a project, right? Um, people are coming and going as well. 
there were some internal movements in the project as well. So there was actually at the time no official official project team that was in charge. Um, it was really difficult to, to consult. It's really difficult to consult with a community that doesn't have a kind of structure, um, that doesn't have clear lines of communication. So even though we felt that we were consulting with the right people, um, that wasn't the opinion of other people who were part of the rest community. Um, it's, it's really difficult when you don't have like structures to, to work with. And, you know, again, we're not saying that that was anyone else's fault but our own. We should have recognized that because there were those lack of structures, we needed to do more as a foundation. Um, and it's easy for the community then to kind of jump on this. Well, we didn't, you didn't consult us. You didn't actually reach out to us. Um, that, you know, that's a fair, that's a fair accusation. Um, even though people had opinions, they didn't realize how they could actually express those in between those two kind of public, big public uh, consultations. And there was a lot of frustration about who, when we were saying, oh, we're consulting the project leadership, you know, people in the community are like, but who is that? Like, I don't know. <laughs> um, so it was, yeah, it was a really kind of difficult, really, really difficult time when you don't have kind of community structures. So I would suggest that if you're thinking about uh, opening this particular can of worms, you have a really good understanding of how the structures are there, but how information is disseminated throughout those structures as well. And we should, if I can just interject, yeah. we should also add, just to clarify this slide, there's of course team leads across the REST project. There's all kinds of representatives within the project, but here, as Beck mentioned, we're sort of talking about what is now called the Leadership Council, and that did, was not in place at the yeah. time that we took this on. It made it challenging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing, you know, as Gracie said at the top of this presentation, the medium we were using maybe wasn't the best. Um, we had doubts about opening just a completely open survey, but we didn't want to put any restrictions on it. Um, Google Forms are great for some things. Um, if you are expecting 3,200 responses, it's probably not the best thing for that. Um, and, you know, it, it's one of those kinds of, it. just the look and feel of it, I think, made it just like immediately, oh, this, this is a bit corporate -y. I don't like this. You know, I, th I think people would have been happier if we'd kind of like put a poll on Reddit or something. Um, but again, it, that's difficult. You know, which platform do you choose if you're only using one? Um, at least with a Google form, you can access it from all of the platforms. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't the best. We probably could have done something much better and much more kind of targeted in terms of, okay, this is how this is gonna be received. So let's not do it as open as possible. Let's be a lot more kind of clear on what we're trying to achieve from this. Um, and one of the really big things that we picked up in, in the feedback was, as I said, because, you know, there was this, this kind of feeling that we were trying to make a power grab. It was kind of tied in with this, I think, fear that individuals like at an individual level had about what we were trying to do. The Rust trademark, we own it, but we don't own it, right? Individual, all the individual Rust stations out there feel really strong ownership over the trademark. It's their trademark. It is trusted because of the amazing work that they do. You know, the Rust trademark isn't trusted because it's owned by the Rust Foundation. It's trusted because all of the maintainers have spent hours and hours and you know, blood, sweat, and tears, making Rust amazing. And those people, you know, want to be able to use that trademark. They want to be able to put it on their kind of Twitter profile if they want, or, you know, maybe change it up a little bit um, for personal use. Um, and there was, there's a lot of personal use. And we really did not respect that enough in terms of the language of, uh, of the draft, the new draft policy. You know, individual creators, we did not fully respect how personally they would take this. And they were taking it personally. And the reaction was, we feel like you are trying to take something away from me that is mine. Um, and it's one of the most valid kind of real kind of emotional responses that we had from so very many people. Um, you know, specifically, you know, 
newly expanded sections talked about things like educational materials and use in your social feeds and you know if you want to print a few t-shirts for your meetup right the, these are things that people feel really strongly about um, and you know they were really vocal in telling us that many many small creators just took this draft as a sign that we were going to like begin policing them essentially we were going to start kind of cracking down and sending them horrible emails saying absolutely not you can't do this um, and whether or not that was actually what the draft said or what it was meant that's how it was taken and that's that's the main thing commercial versus non-commercial was a huge huge issue here um, we should have focused more on distinguishing between the two but also on alluding to what we would and would not be pursuing in terms of enforcing the policy in the future. Um, back to the bandwagon effect. Yes, as, as, um, as we've already mentioned, the whole situation took on a life of its own, right? Um, so many people weighed in without actually knowing what they were commenting on. Um, you know, ever, lots of people like a pylon, um, and this is no different. You know, a lot of people either didn't read the document before commenting or you know, and this was only a small number of cases, I think, but there were definitely some people out there that went out of their way to misinterpret things um, and then to kind of preach that as gospel. Um, and it's really, really difficult then to, to refute something that's already, you know, already incorrect um, because they'll hold something up and say, oh, no, but you said this. Um, and yeah, we're not lawyers either. We're not going to kind of argue points of law on Twitter. Um, so yeah, there was, there was a, a difficulty while all this was kind of rolling in, you know, we had a kind of weak period where we were just being bombarded. Um, and it was, you know, it's really difficult to kind of answer reasonably to your community when you've just got people shouting, 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 shouting. Um, so, you know, the impact was that specific action oriented concerns, you know, the, the real stuff that, that we want to take on board and we want to make sure that makes the new policy better. Um, it kind of got a little bit buried at that point in time in hate speech and targeted harassment, you know, plain old negativity and, you know, cynical people jumping on to, you know, get their own clicks up or get their own shares or, or favoriting up. Um, so even though we attempted to provide context in both of the surveys we issued, we didn't really provide enough enough information or enough opportunity in the actual process between that first survey and putting the draft out. Um, we really could have said a lot more about, okay, these people have been involved in talking about this. We have been reaching out to these people. Um, this is our legal counsel. Um, this is going to happen. This is the timeline, um, how this came to be a priority. So there could have been so much more information out there. Um, you know, it was, an, it was a lack of transparency, not because we were trying to be secretive about it, um, just that we were trying to get shit done, you know. Um, sometimes you've just got a, a list as long as your arm of stuff to do. And again, we just did not respect how controversial or how emotionally charged um, the response was going to be. <laughs> so in terms of the actual feedback trends we did see, um, you know, number one, I think there was a lot of confusion that we noticed around trademark law in the first place, which is very understandable, as Beck just mentioned. And if this wasn't already clear, we are not lawyers. Uh, and, so it's hang very... on, didn't everyone get into open source to know everything about <laughs> trademark law? <laughs> so, because of this, as Beck sort of has already mentioned, a lot of people thought we were going to go after them for saying the word rest, for tweeting the word rest, for using it in the name of a product completely unrelated to the language. And yeah, there are a lot of misconceptions like this about trademark law, and it's very understandable. Uh, trademarks can be very confusing. Legalese is most oftentimes confusing to most of us. There were also a lot of concerns that were shared about the user friendliness of the policy, which is challenging because it is a trademark policy. It's a legal policy. But what we did do and became a problem was try to provide what we called at the time a plain English section at the top, which sort of was meant to summarize the key points and allow people to then skim through the policy. But we got a lot of comments that 
it really wasn't helpful or that it set a bad tone and that it really just truly wasn't plain English enough that has many definitions, of course. So there were some complexities associated with the user friendliness. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, the plain English section was not great. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't have thought we were native speakers. Um, there were so many people fearful, like Gracie says, of being sued. I mean, our main, our main motivation, which was to ensure the integrity um, of Rust, you know, to ensure that the trust in Rust remains intact um, for, and user safety for ecosystem uh, navigation, that was, that was just lost. Um, and yeah. As, as we've said, many people who wrote in kind of just interpreted the whole thing as we are attempting to buy Rust, uh, throw a weight around, take it away from the people who own it as a community and use it to, I don't know, make money or conquer the world or something, it, you know, nefarious. Um, so yeah, all of, all of these things, it was really clear that we really needed to go back to the drawing board. Um, and admit, like we are doing today, that we were really wrong in so many ways. Um, and that we were wrong not because we were up to any um, evil evil doings, but just because we massively misjudged what we were doing, how it would be received, um, and what was really needed. Um, so yeah, this is, this is part of the apology tour. <laughs> One thing just to give you insight into at least where my head was at during this major week that Beck described. When talking about those power grab concerns, I just kept thinking, I think that there are better ways for us to go about <laughs> world domination than this. <laughs> Maybe we should think about that next. <laughs> oh yeah, and after this, if you try this for world domination, they'll definitely see it coming. <laughs> um, so yeah, as a, you know, we've learned some lessons, right? This is the good, this is the good part. We've actually, we've come out the other side unscathed. Um, we are, trying to rebuild trust. We are trying to use, again, some of that amazing actionable feedback that, uh, that we did get to, um, to, to make the draft so much better. So in terms of key lessons, hopefully we've already shared a few along the way, but first up, if you're undertaking this process, as Beck already underscored, consult with representatives of your community. There is just such tremendous value in having those representatives that you that you can collaborate with, and I think we feel that some of this some of this could have been avoided had there been a leadership council for the Rust project in place at the time. That is not to say that they are in any way responsible. The leadership council is not responsible now for what happened then, but just to to suggest that representation and advocacy roles matter tremendously. This is this part's my specialty number two, and I could have a whole other talk about this, maybe I should, but it's very important to have a crisis communication plan in place, uh, both when your team is under stress, but also hopefully to help avoid similar crises in the future. We now have a templated crisis communication plan that emphasizes many things, some of which uh, the importance of response thresholds. So what indices you will see that will tell you it's time to chime in. Pre-drafted messaging, we are very big on that. We try to anticipate any time we will need to lean on bullet points and just all be on the same page about what the key messages are if something like this were to happen again. And also spokespeople who is meant to chime in and speak with the foundation in moments like these. So, and I think the big thing is just having this on hand helps your team reduce stress when emotions are high. And yeah, transparent communication is important, uh, especially in open source. And this was further proof of that. Um, and yeah, we also saw just a lot of confusion, as we already mentioned across the survey, responses about the value and purpose of trademark policies. So we learned essentially how important it is to reassure people who might feel legally vulnerable that you are not out to get them. Um, take the post, yeah, take adequate time to consider feedback before revisiting and take the process as slowly as possible, as, as is necessary. Um, you know, I like getting stuff done. Um, I love, I like going to a board meeting and saying, yep, we've ticked all those things off. Um, 
and yeah, this was not something that I should have been in any way trying to, to rush or to just get done. Um, we needed to, this was something that we really needed to make sure we took all the time we needed, um, which is why we're still here a year later. <laughs> and we are still not quite at the point where we can release another draft for, for consultation. Um, that will be next year's talk. <laughs> um, we're also, you know, continuing to consult the community now. Um, there's, there's value even if it's subject sensitive, obviously, because of this, we know that any time we now talk about trademark, um, a lot of this is going to kind of bubble back up. Um, so we're really kind of considered about how we approach it and, you know, putting all those kind of caveats on making sure that we are kind of putting as much information and context into what we're sharing as possible. Um, and, you know, we, we're trying to maintain a really good amount of, of respect for people that are criticizing us because we did do this, we did do this poorly. Um, and we massively, you know, we massively value the people that told us so without any expletives. Um, but even, you know, the people that do, we know, we understand that there's, there's a frustration there. We work here, you know, because we love how passionate the maintainers are. We love how passionate people are about this. It's way better working with people that are really passionate than people that have no interest in what they're doing whatsoever. Um, sometimes that means you are going to get some pretty surly uh, communications. Um, that's okay. Um, obviously, we try and promote as much respectful communication as possible, but we understand that when people are unhappy uh, or they feel like they've been treated poorly, that you know we're almost kind of inviting that kind of negative response. So we, we really want to make sure that even though we are kind of saying, yeah, this was a kind of wretched experience for, for the team, um, we've, we've learned from it and we still massively value um, all of the feedback that we did get. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions, um, we're more than happy to, to answer them. One thing I would say is if anyone here is thinking about updating their trademark policy or developing their own one, reach out to us. We're more than happy to have a little chat with you and, and <laughs> tell you what not to do. Um, happy to and, open source our process. <laughs> yeah, because again, as I said, this was a pretty wretched process for us. And one of the amazing things that happened during this was so many people from other foundations kind of dropped us a line and said, oh my God, so sorry for you hang in there, we understand, um, you know, don't worry, you aren't actually the worst person in the world. Um, and those messages were really, really helpful. Um, and yeah, we are eager to be there for other people um, who are doing something like this or, you know, any, any kind of thing like this. If you want to reach out to us, we're always happy to, to have a call with you. Uh, but yeah, sorry, uh, were there questions? Um, okay, um, sorry, I've got three people with a hand up in, the, in my exact line. <laughs> Um, so should we go from the back and move forward? <laughs> Amanda?
Yeah, a template would have been kind of helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah. Um, I don't know if we have time for all oh, the questions. Do we? Time. Are we being booted out? Do we have time for? No, one, no one's kicking us out. Right. So. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. It's been really exciting to see enterprise not come to Rust. So like know about an Angular and other cool projects like that. How did those come into the team that exists in the enterprise and those agents created? How did they react to that change? Um, we didn't get much response from uh, commercial side of things. I think, you know, just by virtue of corporates being corporate, right? They're used to kind of corporate T language. Um, yeah, so really, you know, we did have a few um, of our sort of corporate members kind of say, mm, you probably could have done this better. Um, you know, probably could have been less corporate because you don't need to be as a foundation. Um, but yeah, we didn't, one thing we didn't get was a massive kind of negative pushback from, from the commercial sector. Um, but because, yeah, I think it, the language of them was just run of the mill. Sorry, what, did you have your hand yeah. up? Yeah. Sure. Um, so we are 100% not blaming our lawyer. No. <laughs> in case, in case she's no. in the room, <laughs> no one records this. Um, no, we're 100% not. She did what good lawyers want to do, right? Which is absolutely provide as much protection as possible. Um, it was quite frankly my responsibility as the ED to push back and say the community is not going to accept this, um, and now. I know that that's exactly what I had to do. Um, where we are now, basically what I, what we have come back to, gone back to her and said is, look, what we need is something like what we have right now. You know, the, the policy we have right now, can you go away and just make that better? Can you, can you go away and tweak that so that it actually provides the protections you need in the language that it is currently written in? Um, because that is going to be much more accessible to the community um, than trying to start from scratch and, and you know, put something together that, because it, it, it does look very kind of contracty, lawyery, and that's, and that's clearly not something that, that is going to ever speak to the community that we're dealing with. So the, the policy we've got now is quite similar to what Python's got. Um, so it is, it is very plain English. It is very understandable. You know, I understand it. Um, my old dad probably understands it. Um, what we need is we need her, and, and this is where we are now, we've gone back and made a draft that is literally that policy with additions and subtractions and, and changes so that people can, can understand that. Again, it's, it's, not, it's not ready yet. Um, we are still kind of talking um, with some of the leadership about it, but I'm hopeful that that will be much better received. In fact, I really, really hope what people say when they see that new draft is, it's not exactly the same as the old draft. Why didn't they just do this in the first place? And if we get that reaction, like that'll make the game. <laughs> okay, we're done. Okay, thank you, thank so, you much. so much everyone for coming. Grab some Ferris stickers up here.